So I'm Francesco, and today we'll try to give you some insights into our uh, super resolution project that we've been doing for the past few months uh, at Idealo, which is a price conversion company, which is kind of irrelevant for the um, moment. So I will show you why we did it at Idealo, why we started with this project at first, um, and then I'm going to just show you what uh, image super resolution is, single image super resolution is in the context of deep learning. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the literature to give you an overview where it kind of came from and where it's now, as well as showing you some networks, actually one network, uh, and the details of it. Then I, will, then I will proceed to show you the standard approach for it, um, what the problems with this approach are, and um, some of the results. And then we're going to try to fit this um, algorithm, this technique, to our needs. So we're going to try to have some perceptual improvements, including denoising. We're going to use some uh, features coming from other networks. And of course, at the end, we introduce an adversarial loss, because that's, that's, that's good with images. And at the end, if there is time, uh, we're going to have a look at model averaging, which is convenient in this context, and latency issue, if time allows. So, yeah. So business motivation. This is this is literally the second page I've ever visited on the Idealo webpage. Um, it's one of the pro products on the product catalog. It's a coffee grinder. Uh, I like coffee. I wanted to grind my own, and I found this page. And if you click on the image there, um, you kind of could see the details and everything. You could see if this actually is what you need, uh, and this is what you would expect, like a, a picture that kind of fills up. But this is what you get: a kind of lonely picture in the middle of white. And well, that's not really desirable, uh, at least for the looks of it. So this is like why we could do this. Um, but the real thing is that it's an interesting project, so that's why uh, we want to do it. And this is what, it's, what it looks like uh, to do super resolution with neural nets. Um, on the left-hand si left side, you have a low resolution input, so a small image, um, which you feed through a convolutional neural network made ad hoc. Um, this spits out a super result output, so a larger image, um, yeah. and you compare it with the original one uh, that you have in your data set. Uh, you compute some loss, you backpropagate, update the weights, repeat until you're happy. Um, so this is what it looks like um, for the very basic part of it. So on top here we still have the original, we compare it with a here mean squared error. You can use uh, mean average error, actually that converges better. Um, but there is more things to it you could do um, to have a better loss. And now I'm just going to give you an overview of what it looks like, but then I'm going to go through details a little more. Um, so you could, for example, add to your, um, to your loss a um, feature extractor. So basically, a, for example, here a, a um, classification network, the VGG network. You feed to the network both of your images and compare them at some uh, features that this network extracts and yeah, add it to your loss. And you could also add, uh, as I said, the adversarial network. So this is the big picture. Let's have a look. So this is, again, the literature. Uh, it started in 2015 with Dong et al, where they basically approached it as a image reconstruction problem. They would upscale it with some baseline technique and then, then make it look better. Then from 2016 on, they went from a more end-to-end -end approach, which is more common. And the last three papers are the ones that I'm going to take uh, elements from um, to construct our final sort of, say, model. Um, specifically, I'm going to choose the Result Dance Network for Image Super Resolution, which was published in 2018. And I'm going to show you just after this slide, I think, why we chose this. Um, but basically, uh, sorry, I'm going to show you the network. But the reason why we chose it is that um, it basically had the lightest architecture, thanks to some clever tricks they used, uh, such as uh, residual connections. Um, it was the best at the time on the common evaluation metric, which is basically what people compare the various approaches with, which is going to turn out to not, not to be the best thing to, to, to use for evaluating your model, but we're going to see that later. Um, Thanks to being lighter, is less data hungry, and all the other components that were featured in other papers can be added at, at the end, such as multi-scaling or all the rest. So, as a core solution, that was that was good. And this is what it looks like. This is actually a fairly common um, structure, sorry, <laughs> for uh, for for ISR networks. 
Uh, you have, again, on the left-hand side, uh, low-resolution input, one convolutional layer, one or multiple. Um, and then you have this kind of block-like structure. Um, these blocks have, have their own uh, shape and form, but you stack very many of them. And after a while, you connect all of them together and process your output. There is very often a uh, residual connection between the very early layers and uh, all the layers until and the output of the last layer before the upscaling layer. And after this residual connection, which helps with learning, with uh, vanishing gradients, and all these kind of things, uh, there is an upscaling layer, which is typically, especially recently, implemented with a pixel shuffle operation, which rearranges your, your feature maps into whatever you want to look like. In this case, it's a double-sized input uh, output. Uh, then you, re rest uh, you reconstruct the image with another convolution layer, and there you have your, um, your high-resolution output. Um, and this is, one, this is the structure of the block, of the red parts up there. Uh, as you can see, it's called residual dance block. Residual because you connect the input of the, of the block to the output with an addition operation, a residual connection. And it's called dance because Every output and every input is passed to uh, all the subsequent layers. So the input of the block is passed to the first, to the second, to the sixth um, convolutional layer. And for each output of each convolutional layer, you do the same. So it becomes densely connected uh, between layers. At the end, again, you do a concatenation operation, a one by one convolution, and pass it to the next block. Um, there are a few things you need to remember from this slide. Actually, three things. And it's the letters C, D, and G. G you can't see here, but um, D is the number of blocks we have in the network. This is going to be useful later when we examine like the time consumption, basically. Uh, so you have D blocks, and instead of the inside of each block, you have C convolutional uh, layers. So if you have D equals to 10, so you have 10 blocks, C and 3, for example, uh, convolutional layers inside you have 30 in total. Um, we're actually going to train a network that has around 120 layers. Um, and mind that all these operations that you see, all these densely connected um, arrows, they represent concatenation operations. So you basically concatenate all the outputs. Um, and G, right. G is how wide these convolutions are, so how many uh, uh, feature maps they output. So, f for example, it's G64. Uh, you input to the first convolution layer 64 feature maps. To the second, you're going to have 128, 176, and so on. Uh, so it, it becomes very, very wide, um, very quickly. Um, and this is the evaluation metric, so the peak, to s peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR, uh, which is a fancy name for a logarithmically scaled mean squared error. Um, negative, so the higher the better. We don't really need to focus too much on this. Just remind, remember that it's pixel-wise, so we compare pixel by pixel. Okay, uh, and this is uh, the setup for the first iteration, the first training session we had basically. We use the pixel-wise mean squared error as a last function, and this is probably the thing we're going to change the most. Then we use scarce because it's simple. Um, with TensorFlow backend. And we train on the diverse 2K open data set, uh, which is, you can find online. It was used for a competition in 2016, 17. Uh, it has 800 training images. And I used five validation images. Uh, and this actually, this number five was to kind of stick with what the papers were doing. I'm going to change it later because it, yeah, it's, I don't think it's the best choice. It's not enough. And um, we were feeding batches of 16 image patches. We'd been training for one day on a P2X large instance. That was actually around 86 epochs of training. And we monitor everything with TensorBoard. So if you're somehow familiar with deep learning, you might ask yourself, wait, what a second? Why, why 800 images? That doesn't sound, that doesn't, doesn't sound right. Um, you should be in billions, right? But the thing is that each image, well, so we don't, we don't, we're not doing classification, so we don't need the entire picture. Uh, we don't need to find what elements are in the picture. We don't need to find the logical combination between those elements. So we can just chop it up, take patches, small ones, and fit those to the network. So if you randomly extract patches from one image 
and augment them, you basically have a data set that is as large as you need it to be. Uh, of course, if you have more, it is better, but it's not crucial. So you can actually train on, on such a small data set. And the reason why these data sets are typically small is because data quality is very crucial. Um, so yeah, we extract patches and we feed it to the network as a batch. Um, this is just what training looks like, so it's simple. The training loss and validation loss, they go down, uh, no, no doubt about that. The training PSNR goes up, so it works. And this is, this is how you see it, it, it just, it's fine. Um, and this is a sample image. Now, this highly relies on the resolution of the screen. So I don't know if you can see the difference, but basically on the, on the left-hand side, you have the original image, so patches extracted from the original, original image. In the middle, you have a patches that are um, taken from the bicubic scaled image, which we use as a baseline, which is basically what you use normally when you do simple upscaling with GIMP, for example. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have the super resolved output. So I don't know if you can tell, but the details are crisper um, in the super resolved image. Uh, it's quite a, quite, a, quite a bit better than, than the bicubic baseline. Basically, the main difference is that that's a little more washed out, whereas here it's, it's able to kind of yeah, sharpen everything. Uh, one thing you might notice is the PSNR values. Um, for the bicubic scaling baseline, the PSNR values are around 34.5, and this is like basically 1.5 more. Uh, so it's not much, uh, but the perceptual quality is there. So uh, the perceptual quality difference is there. So remember, it's a logarithmic like scale, so it kind of plateaus and small Variations in PSNR might mean uh, significant uh, differences in quality. So to proceed, um, that's all good and fine. But where does the model per like? What are the problems of the model? Where does it? How does it work? You know, we wanted to have a look into this. So I fed the I, I upscaled the entire validation set, and from each image, I would chop it up and extract uh, the batches with the minimum and maximum PSNR values to see where it does well, where it doesn't. And as you can see, on the left side, you have the um, patches that have minimum PSNR values. And they are very rich in detail. They are kind of, there's many things going on. Whereas on the right hand side, it's flat. It's just basically colors. If I actually had to take larger images, larger patches, because otherwise it would just be really only uh, colored squares, um, which wouldn't tell much. Um, but yet, this is one of the lower PSNR patches. I mean, this is unsurprising, right? It's, if it's more detailed, it's probably more complex to, to upscale. Um, <clears throat> and this is one of the lower PSNR patches, so still, even though it doesn't quite fit with the original image, you can see how it got sharpened and like it, the lines are kind of more, they can kind of make more sense. And this is that to, you, to give you an uh, overview of, of what, it, what these values are. So light means good, dark means bad, lower PSNR values, and you can see how, how, how the, the parts rich in detail are, are uh, the ones that have the lower, lower values. So, um, so we said that we wanted to apply this to, to uh, Idealos product catalog, right? Um, we tried it, uh, this is what we got. This is like a little sample. Uh, in the red boxes, you have the bicubic scaling baseline, and the, in the green boxes, the super resolved uh, counterpart. Um, you can see that, again, details are more sharp, but the issue, the issue here is that those images are not great, and they have some JPEG artifacts, and also these artifacts get sharpened up, and that's not desirable. The images kind of lose, lose quality. So although it works well when you use good images, it doesn't do great when you do this. I mean, it does well, but it doesn't know what to do yet. So what are the issues and the directions we should take from here? Um, <coughs> first, the noise ag is aggravated, so we need to learn the noising. And to do this, we said maybe we can train on our own data. We have the same distribution, maybe things work better. Um, bad idea. Uh, our own data, as we just saw, it has JPEG artifacts, and we need really high quality data. So the deep 2 data set, for example, is a very highly curated data set, check it out, it's, it's good. Um, another thing we could do is try perceptual loss, so those combination of things that I showed before, to kind of ignore the, the JPEG artifacts, which are, for example, irrelevant for classification, and try to have the, lo try to have the loss function focus on, on what, what really we, 
we wanted to focus on, which is the details. And yeah, biblical prediction times. It takes a very long time. Um, the way the network works, I didn't mention this, I should have. In those blocks that you've seen, basically it builds different representation of the input image, very many of them, and then it combines them non-linearly, right? But those um, blocks tend to become very large, and the number of operations that you have to perform uh, is very high. So it takes a long time. And so we're going to have a look at how the various parameters of the network influence training time and, and uh, sorry, prediction time. And we're going to have a look how to train a ladder model that kind of balances speed and, and quality. Or we could come up with a different architecture, which is actually what I'm working on right now. But this is, yeah, in progress, so I'm maybe not going to say much about it. So compression artifacts. Um, OK, we want to learn denoising. Um, a reasonable thing to do, would, it seems to be you take the input images, add some JPEG artifact to them, and try to ask the network to upscale it such that it looks like the original one without artifacts. This sounds reasonable. I tried to um, do it. I tried to control this, so I pre-processed the data set with fixed percentage of compression rate. So for example, half quality, 70%, 80%. Um, and when you look at the graphs, um, it's a little more bumpy, but it does go up, and it doesn't reach the levels that in, with a similar number of, of, of um, epochs. Actually, here, we retrain on top of the model we had. So it's sort of transfer learning, but not really. It's like literally the same model we, that we keep training on a different data set. Uh, and the PSNR values, they don't reach as, um, as high values anymore. But it is a harder problem, so that was to be expected. The real issue here is that it doesn't work great. Um, I mean, it does what you ask it to do. Um, on the left side, we have the original model. And these are two sample pictures, again, the teddy bears. I think they're good um, to show this off. Um, and you can see that the more you add uh, compression rate to your compression to your, to your input images, the more it learns to remove them. If you look here on the right-hand side, there, is, there isn't really many compression artifacts anymore. Uh, they're smooth, but they're way too smooth. Like, all the details are gone. And we might have just used probably some, some normal denoiser for this. So it goes in sort of the right direction, but it does it in the wrong way. So how can we, how can we make it work better? OK. As I mentioned before, um, using, using features coming from a classification network might help the loss function to focus on what is relevant for classification, um, which happen to be correlated with what people think uh, with, with perceptual quality feeling of people. So, so um, basically what is relevant for a human and for a network to recognize an image um, are kind of the same thing and these are, happen to be important also for visual quality. So the idea here is, okay, we, uh, once we have the super, resolution, the super resolved image, we give it to the network, to the VGG network, extract some intermediate layers, um, and compare those uh, outputs um, point-wise with a mean squared error, for example, and minimize this. So if you do this, again, you are minimizing in what matters for classification. The idea here is this just like from top to bottom, some deeper and deeper layers of the VGD network. As you can see, at the, at the top, the cat looks like a cat. Uh, and the more you go down, the less it looks like a cat. It's more abstracted. Um, for example, in the bottom left, Second image, those white, uh, those yellow dots could be the eyes, for example, could somehow represent those. So we want to focus on these parts that are that should care less about noise and more about uh, the the relevant parts. Again, um, good. We just we, we do it. Um, PSNR values are even lower, as you can see here. They reach around 26, which is the worst. Um, you can get even if you use a normal baseline, you get around 30. Four, three, four, so so it doesn't look great from the PSNR value, and on the left, on the right, you have the loss evaluated on those features. Um, the tra the optimization landscape gets a little a little more bumpy, so you need to be careful. We had to find a, a learning a decay schedule. We had to tune the optimizers parameters. Actually, it's common that when you use 
uh, residual networks and very deep networks, you have to take care of, you have to be careful with the momentum part of your, of your um, optimizer. And then again, we retrain on the diff to K with 50% compression rate. And this is what we got. So uh, on the left-hand side, you have the original model that was doing denoising the uh, naive way. On the right-hand side, you have the original model without any denoising. And in the middle, you have denoising using, the, using this loss function, uh, using the VGG features as loss function. And again, the noise is kind of gone, and the details are more present. We use the same compression rate for both uh, trainings. And so this is kind of going in the right direction. Um, I think this is I was already impressed on how well it worked, because it was really like removing part of the noise with, with no significant drop in detail. But here we can see that already there is some artifacts, and it doesn't look that great yet. I think the, I thought from here we could improve. Um, yeah, you, you can see especially here some square light, square like um, artifacts are introduced. Um, this is another example uh, on a other part of the image. And again, on the top you have without these features, and at the bottom we add these features with denoising. And you can see, for example, how the line of this cat on the left, I assume is a cat, um, are, are more marked. So they are focusing on lines, which are helpful for, for recognizing the image. And again, but there is some square-like artifacts. I think this, I was already satisfied with this result, but I wanted to kind of get rid of those artifacts. So as a first thing, I tried to retrain on like taking those features out to kind of remod the image. Uh, after it was focusing on the right things, and it kind of works with something in between, but you know this is just for fun um, now let's let's let 's try to use GANs to even go further from here so why why would we want to introduce GANs except everybody 's doing it, and they 're great um, well, because they are great they, they do they, they do deliver excellent results in terms of realism when you do computer vision, and basically they are good at making sense of noise if you if you see some examples like this website called this person doesn't exist. Have you ever heard of this? Right. No? So basically, it's, it's a website that if you, if you visit the page, it's called, yeah, thispersonalistics.com. You go there, and they show you an image of a face, a face of someone. Then if you refresh it, this image changes, and it's another face, and you can keep doing it forever, because those are not real faces. Those are actually generated artificially with GANs. Um, there's also a kitty website, but those kitties are very creepy, so <laughs> just no. Don't, don't go there. I mean, no, go there, it's fun, but they don't work always perfectly, so uh, it's, it's kind of... Uh, and they have shown to be working well in combination with those deep features that we've been using so far. So, right, let's use, let's use this... Um, uh, oh yeah, making sense of noise. Like The way you generate those faces is just feeding... Well, the way you generate some uh, realistic-looking images is by feeding random noise, random vectors to it, and they kind of learn how to map those to, to things that kind of make sense by learning from a data set. Um, so we could use those to cancel the noise while keeping the detail level. And by keeping, of course, I mean making it up, because it's not there, and, and they, they would just reproduce what, is, what they've seen from other images. And, and um, yeah, this is what it looks like. Uh, the, the VGG component is not there anymore, but it is still there. It just for showing you. Um, at the top, we have the training cycle of the, uh, the ISR network, so the network does upscaling. And in the lower part, we have the training for the uh, adversarial network. Um, this really important here is to know that up here, we do not train the network, the adversarial network, because what we're trying to do there is fool it. So we take the low resolution input, give it to the ISR network, get the super resolved input out, and give it to the adversarial uh, counterpart. Mm. This guy is going to give us an uh, output, a tensor, um, which ideally we would like it to be made up of ones, because that's, that's what we say it's a label for, for a real image. Uh, of course, the network is going to tell it, mm, probably this is not a real image if it's, if it's smart. If it's, not good, then we need to improve it. But basically, we wanted to predict the wrong thing. We do cross entropy and update only the ISR network. Um, and here again, we don't train it, otherwise, it would learn to do the wrong thing. In the bottom, we have uh, the training cycle for, for the adversarial network, where we just 
train it to predict the right thing. So high resolution image, it should be mapped to a valid or true uh, kind of label. And here again, we don't use a number. Um, we have a tensor of, of uh, values between zero and one. Um, just to give you a glance on, on what it means to train these guys is, so those are the values. On the left-hand side, you have the PSNR values of the generator network, so the ISR network. And on the right-hand side, you have the loss of the discriminator. Um, you can maybe notice those are even validation, validation uh, values, so it's, it's more stable than the training. The training is like ranging of, in a huge span of, uh, of PSNR values. Um, but as you can see, they kind of oscillate. They don't really nicely converge to the top. Uh, they start at random points. Um, here, actually, the various levels and the various colors are because I was using different VGG features in it and different setups uh, for the discriminator network. But the point here is, as you can see here on the right-hand side, it never converges. So it's kind of it's hard to tell when it's done, especially if your evaluation metric is not the best. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to tell you later why. Um, just have a look to the results of this now. Um, so this is the shoe image that I showed you before. Uh, and this is, if we do upscaling, the basic way. So, so pixel-wise error without denoising. Now we introduce denoising uh, with a 50% compression rate of the data set. And you can see that the, yeah, the artifacts are gone, but also the details are, are not as sharp anymore. This is what we got when we introduced the VGG uh, features. And I, again, the, the, the details are definitely sharper, but it looks queryish. Um, so let's now try with GANs and make it look realistic. And there is some improvement um, from here to here. So the, the artifacts are gone. As you can see here, the kind of letter, it's clear. The details are, are marked. You see the lines, they are, they are present. Um, the colors shifted a little bit. Actually, here I made a mistake. Um, I was yeah, there was some mismatch between input and output patches that happens, um, which are then fixed. But this is what you get if you, so you, you, can, you can really add some more realism, heuristic touch to the images. Um, and this is, again, trained to do compression, uh, to do uh, denoising. If you didn't train for the denoising, this is what you get. And here I corrected the color shift. Um, so it looks a lot sharper. There's like details are hallucinated, uh, but also the noise is kind of hallucinated as well. Um, so it's a little sharper, but this is not uh, ideal for every case, but it, they, they are nice. Um, and this is a very common image in, um, in the literature. Uh, this is a baboon picture uh, on the top. You see, top left, you see the original. And here we do four times up, uh, upscaling. And this is the bicubic baseline. So if you do it with any program. And this is if you, what you get with the um, Pixel by pixel driven um, function loss. And if you add GANs, things become more interesting. Uh, there is details that were not, I don't think it was really possible to distinguish from here, but they basically have learned from the data set and applied to this image. So you do, you do reach a level of realism which is uh, beyond what you could normally get um, by learning this dynamic loss function. Yeah. Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, here, I show you the effects. So, so what you had to do was choosing those VGG feature layers uh, to fit it, to, to train it with. And if you choose different one, you get different results. On the left of the squirrels, uh, in squirrel image, you see the PSNR training. Here, everything looks pretty decent anyways, because it's, it's from far away. And one, one thing that you probably notice is if you use later layers, so deeper layers in the network, such as yeah, the 20th uh, or 19th of the VGG19. You, you do get crispier details, so everything looks sharper, but also you, introduce, you tend to introduce a lot of artifacts. As opposed to the early years, which are, which are um, less artifact prone, but, but yeah, less sharp. So a good combination is just to use a wide range of it. So if you are to do this, try to, get, try to use many of those VGG features layers. Uh, it just works better. Uh, so again, early layer are easy to control for sticking with the original image, so good, better colors, no artifacts, but they're less detailed, as opposed to the later layers, which are harder to control. They tend to deviate from the original, original image, but they do give you sharper details. Um, so yeah, use a 
combination of those. Model interpolation, so I'm going to just quickly skip through all of this. Um, basically, to do denoising is something that is definitely dependent on what image you use as an input. Uh, you can, might do more or less, um, but basically the way you achieve different levels of denoising is by training on different com differently compressed data sets, and that doesn't work um, for all images. So you, you don't want to have multiple models. You don't want to train a Aleph 1 model just for having all the possibilities. And you don't want to do multiple inferences per image because you could have two models, one that does a lot of uh, denoising and one that does nothing, like no denoising, and you could average the results. But again, here, they're slow. We don't want to do multiple inferences. So what works here, luckily, is averaging the weights of the, of the network. You train two or n models and take a weighted average. And by moving the parameter of this average, you do get consistent results. Again, here, there is some color shift again, because of the mistake I've made. Um, but so this way, you, you have all the range without multiple inferences and with few models, which is good. Prediction times, yeah. So just, just to give you an insight, um, the C, so the, 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 the size of the blocks uh, influences uh, uh, quadratically on the prediction uh, times, whereas the number of blocks uh, influences linearly. Uh, and uh, the effect is more and more evident the more the more bigger the images are. So to kind of overcome this, uh, I have I used as originally I used c equal to six and equal to twenty, so that's 120 layers. I held both of those parameters and the feature maps to have a 10 times speed up, and the, perceptually the results are kind of similar. So the PSN values vary by a little bit, but that doesn't matter in applications. I should speed up. Recap. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you want to check it out, we, I, I, I put everything I've done, all, every code I've used, every single script in a nice package which you, can, you can pip install. I think it's good because it's one major issue here was tracking your, the, the experiments. It was actually my first deep learning project, so I didn't really know what the right parameters at the beginning were to keep track of. Turns out everything is important, and if you think it's not, it is. So I made up, a, I think, a decent, a decent way of uh, tracking your experiments to customize everything. And we give you some pre-trained rates, which you can use, and in three lines of code, four with an import statement, you can, you can do upscaling. So check it out. It's on the Idealo uh, GitHub page. Right. Thank you. <laughs>